you got to give me my five minutes at least. <laughs> so no, we're not done. <laughs> we'll begin today with a, a word from the Lord. If you are following along in our church Bibles, it's page 899 and it's Psalm 63 today. It's a Psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. Some translations say in the wilderness. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Oh, my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. They who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God's name will praise him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. We ask that God add his blessing to his word. Today we are talking about passion. And as we are talking about psalms for the seasons of life, we are talking about summer this week, as I mentioned last week, that uh, we're kind of going in reverse. We usually talk about spring, summer, fall, winter. But we started with winter, and last week was fall, and now we're summer. And next week is joy, spring, fifth Sunday fun day. <laughs> what joy. But today, we're in summer. And if you're not sure about that, just step outside. <laughs> because summer is here and it is hot. Yeah. If you have lived elsewhere other than Phoenix, you know that there's such thing as seasons. And summertime in the Midwest is hot and it's sticky. Here in Arizona, that's what we don't have. And a lot of people are grateful for that. The big catchphrase for Arizona is, but it's a dry heat. So is an oven. That doesn't mean I want to live in it. But for summertime, we connected the word passion to it. And that reason is that heat is often associated with passion. When somebody is passionate about something, we often say they're on fire for it, right? That person is really on fire. Or if you're on fire for something, it's because you're passionate about it. You're passionate about a certain ministry or you're passionate about something. And of course, passion we often associate with relationships too. And when somebody is passionate about somebody, they're really fired up about that person. So passion fits well with summer. And the summer of our lives is oftentimes associated with when we begin to see things come to fruition. We begin to see the works and the things that we have been doing finally kind of coming to, you know, what we were hoping for, our goals being reached. We said that fall was a time of abundance and harvest where we kind of got to sit back and reap what we've sown all these years. Well, summer is that time where we have sown and we're beginning to see things come to fruition. In the Midwest, they talk about corn, that it needs to be knee high by the 4th of July. I'm from the Midwest, by the way, if you haven't figured that out yet. And that means that, you know, it's not ready to be picked yet, but if it's knee high by the 4th of July, it's on target. And pretty soon, you'll be having sweet corn. So summertime is when we begin to see all of these things that we have been building into, all of these things that we have been wanting to do, striving for, work, goals, all of that kind of stuff. We're beginning to see that stuff come into being. Things 
start to look clearer. But success in any part of our lives, whether it's love, career, relationships, or spiritual development, is never easy. And we can't just kind of sit back on our laurels and say, okay, I've done everything I need to do. I can kick back and relax. Summertime is not the time for that. And that's why passion is so important. Because it requires a consistent effort to overcome the obstacles and all of the things that life kind of keeps throwing at us. It doesn't make any difference if we're young, if we're in the Middle Ages, if we're older. We're always going to have stuff coming our way. We're always going to have some obstacle or something. I wish I could say that life is easy, but it's not for none of us. It may appear that way looking in on some people's lives, but it's not. Everybody has their obstacles. Everybody has their thing that they're trying to overcome, their issue that they're dealing with. It doesn't matter. It could be career. It could be relational. It could be spiritual. But we're all in that. Yes, there's times when things seem like they're going really well, and then there's times when they're not. It's the hills and the valleys of life. So we can't kick back and relax when it's summertime. We have to keep stoking that fire, that passion that we have. So my question to you today is, is your heart in love with God? Let that sink in. Is your heart in love with God? Unfortunately, words like love, affection, and longing oftentimes don't describe our relationship with God. I'm guilty of that. I can think about God, and I know God, and I can have faith in God, but oftentimes I have to check myself and ask that question. Is my heart in love with God? Do I really love God? Am I passionate about God? Do I have a longing in my heart for Him that supersedes everything else in my life? Many days it doesn't. And it's sad. Because many people in our church today describe having faith in God. We, we know that there's a spiritualness in the world today. Oftentimes we hear people talk about believing in God, having faith in God. But yet, that faith doesn't equate to having feelings for God. Now, oftentimes, to be true to, to what we talk about, we tell people that your feelings can't dictate your, your faith in God. Because if all we do is rely on our feelings and our emotions when it comes to God, we tend to be like waves in the ocean. We just kind of come and go. We're, we're blown this way and that way by with whatever way we're feeling. So we have to stand firm on our faith and, and we go with the facts and the things that we know to be true, that God's promises are real. But that doesn't negate the fact that we have to have feelings for God. God is a relational God, and relationship automatically connects to feelings. So if we're going to be passionate about God, we have to go beyond just faith and believing in God. After all, they say, demons believe in God too, but they're not passionate about Him. So as Christ followers, we have to be passionate. We have to have feelings for God. That's where we differentiate ourselves somewhat from our more charismatic brothers and sisters. Reformed thinkers tend to have a lot of the head knowledge. Their love for God is in their heads. Our more charismatic brothers and sisters wear their emotions on their sleeves. They're passionate, and their passion shows. But we have to find that, that even ground, that middle ground between the two. We can't be so emotional or so heady, but we have to be 
in love with God. We have to be passionate for God. So how do we get that kind of love for God? Well, in our psalm today, David's psalm, Psalm 63, as it says, it's another one of those that describes what's going on and what kind of prompted David's writing of this psalm. And David is in the wilderness. His son Absalom had come into Jerusalem, or David was told that he was coming into Jerusalem to kill David and take over the throne by force. And so David rounded up his people in his household and his wives and children and, and workers and people that were supportive of him, and they headed out into the wilderness. He left his concubines behind. Nice. Absalom could do whatever he wanted with them. And there's more to that story if you want to get into the Old Testament stuff and how that all came out to play, that God predicted that would happen. But David headed out into the wilderness to, to save his life. And so he's away from Jerusalem. He's away from the temple. He's away from the place of worship where he has always spent his time, where he is away physically and spiritually. David worshiped the Lord and his words in the Psalms describe that. Now I'm going to read for you again, like I did last week. I'm going to read from the Psalms from the message because I really believe that, well, I'm not a poet and I've never really been into poetry and Psalms are poetry and they don't make a lot of sense. You can read them like I read at the beginning, but it's all this imagery and language that, you know, that, that's what poetry is. And I appreciate it. I, I can appreciate people who love poetry and people who write poetry, but I've never got it. But when I read the message, it makes a lot more sense. So here's the message version of this. God, you're my God. I can't get enough of you. I've worked up so much hunger and thirst for God traveling across dry and weary deserts. So here I am in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength and glory. In your generous love, I am really living at last. My lips brim praises like fountains. I bless you every time I take a breath. My arms wave like banners of praise to you. I eat my fill of prime rib and gravy. I smack my lips. It's time to shout praises. If I'm sleepless at midnight, I spend the hours in grateful reflection because you've always stood up for me. I'm free to run and play. I hold on to you for dear life and you hold me steady as a post. Those who are out to get me are marked for doom, marked for death, bound for hell. They'll die violent deaths. Jackals will tear them limb from limb. But the king is glad in God. His true friends spread the joy while small-minded gossips are gagged for good. Hmm. That is a song that just drips with passion for God. And that's how David was. We know those of us who have read the Bible or have heard much about it, particularly about King David, he's referred to as a man after God's own heart. It's an obsession. You could almost say it's an addiction. Because what is an addiction? It's desiring after one thing. That's all you can think about, is that one thing. Anybody who has dealt with people with addictions or has been addicted knows you'll do anything for that one thing. Anything. People think that, well, a love of family will override that. Nope. If I just care for that person enough, it'll defeat that. Nope. But David had this addiction for God. It was the one thing he desired above everything else. And that's where we should be. 
Psalm 27, 4 refers to this. I have asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. How many of us can say that? That we ask that one thing of the Lord. It is the one desire that we have to dwell in the house of the Lord. Ironically, this is biblical Christianity, worshiping God. Now, worship isn't mandatory, but it should be because God is worthy of our worship. But Jesus went so far as to say early in his ministry to people, he went so far as to say, if you want to follow me, you have to hate your mother and father and hate your brother and sister. That's weird. Ten Commandments tell us to honor our father and our mother. How can Jesus come around and say, hate your brother and sister or mother and father? Well, Jesus wasn't going against the Ten Commandments. He wouldn't do that. So what Jesus was saying is, if you want to follow me, your love and your obsession, your addiction to me has to be so great that the love for your mother and father, brother and sister is as if you hate them. That's what he's saying. It's an obsession. Do we want God more than we want anything else in this world? Do we? Can we answer that honestly and say yes? This psalm shares in what David, and it's a song about worship. Worshiping God, not because he has to or that he needs to, it is because he longs to worship God. Last week we talked about the idea that, you know, we eat junk food all week long and then we come one day a week to, to church to have a salad <laughs> and we consider ourselves to be healthy. Like that one salad is going to, you know, cancel out those 20 meals of junk. David longs for the Lord. He longs to worship him. That is what drives him. That is what keeps him going. He's in the wilderness. His life is in danger. People are out to kill him. If you read this story further in the Bible, he's made fun of. He's ridiculed. But yet, he knows that God is there for him. He knows the greatness of God. And it's not that we must worship God. We should want to worship God. There was a movie out not too long ago. And this is a relationship thing all along. Anybody can relate to this. The gal was telling the guy that she wanted him to wash the dishes. And he says, I'll wash the dishes. She says, no, I want you to want to wash the dishes. I don't want to wash the dishes, but I want you to want to wash the dishes for me. But I don't want to wash the dishes, but I'll wash the dishes. It's that kind of a connection. We should want to want to worship God, not just because we have to or because it's mandatory, but because we desire him so much that he is the only thing in our lives that we want above everything else. We don't view worship as duty. Coming to church should not be something that we have to do. I would rather have people stay home if they're coming to church out of duty. I want people to come to church because they want to worship God. Not to satisfy me, not to satisfy Pastor Kelly, not to do it because it's the thing to do. We gather together as Christ followers because we together are stronger than we are separate. We can face the wilderness as a group much better than we can on our own. Yes, 
You can stay at home and worship. You can stay at home and you can watch the greatest speakers much better than I am on YouTube or TV or anything like that. And you can get a great message, but you're not going to get the community of worship. And you're not going to get the same effect of worshiping God with other believers. Believe me, there's Sundays that I can wake up and go, oh God, I gotta go to church. <laughs> and I've told Pastor Kelly, you know, one of these Sundays, I think I'm just not gonna show up for church because hey, it's the only day I get to sleep in. Technically it's not. <laughs> Or, I've had a busy day. I spent nine hours working in the kitchen yesterday. <laughs> I really just want to stay home and rest. What would we do? Pastor Kelly would have to pitch it. She'd get up here and go, where's Pastor Fred? Is he not here today? I wouldn't do that to you. Because I want to worship God. I want to be here in fellowship with each of you. I draw just as much strength and encouragement from you as I hope that you draw from me. Right so we shouldn't view worship as our duty. We should view it as our delight. We should delight in the Lord. We should delight in being able to come together with fellow Christians, supporting one another, encouraging one another. And let our passion just continue to be stoked. Because that's what happens when we come together. David is in the wilderness because people wish to take his life. David was still able to glorify God. He was able to worship him even in the wilderness. Even though somebody was chasing after him or wanted him dead, he was still able to look up to the giver of all goodness and praise God. He uses that language in here. Raising his hands, singing praises, that's worship. Now it doesn't mean that we all have to stand here and raise our hands. It doesn't mean we all have to be able to sing with the best voice in the world. There is a reason why it says make a joyful noise. <laughs> But none of that should matter. We should be able to worship God however we feel comfortable worshiping God. If it is standing there with our hands raised in the air, singing as loud as the top of our lungs, or if it's standing there still, just allowing the music to flow over us and the words to, to seep into our soul. Worship God with all of your heart. We live in a wilderness we oftentimes find ourselves in a wilderness. Maybe it's physical health, mental health. Maybe it's career issues or work issues, family or relationship issues. Or maybe it's just fear of what tomorrow brings. We will all go through periods of time in the wilderness and you might be going through that right now. But it doesn't matter what is happening in our lives. Faith tells us to look up to the giver who is always there. That's what David tells us in this psalm. God is forever present. God is always there, even when we feel like he's not. He loves you. He satisfies you. And his love lasts longer than life itself. And if you don't believe me, just hear these words from John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever should believe in him will have eternal life. Jesus lasts longer than life itself. He overrides it. And with that, we can be passionate about God and we can be passionate about Jesus. Don't let your fire burn out. Let it burn stronger. Be passionate. Today, our unison prayer is a prayer of worship to the Father. There's a handout in your bulletin, and the words will be on the screen. Let us pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I desire to learn how to worship you as you deserve. Help me, Lord, to grow into the sort of worshiper that you are seeking, one who worships you in spirit and truth. I pray that my life may be one that honors you in all I say and all I do, in all the circumstances of life, throughout the day, and as I drift into sleep at night. Lord, I pray that I may learn to walk in all your ways, to serve with all my being, and to learn to love you as you have loved me. Teach me, Lord, how to worship you in the beauty of holiness, so that I may be one that bows my heart before you in spirit and truth, to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let us continue to pray for folks within our midst. Lord Jesus, we lift up to you, Michelle Barnard. And Lord, we pray for Michelle uh, with the diagnosis that she has a lump in her chest. And so, Lord, we just pray that uh, all will come together as you need to, uh, to bring about health and healing for her. God, we pray for Joanne, her mom, as, we, as she comes alongside her and walks with her through this diagnosis and ultimate recovery. Lord, we continue to pray for Deb Richard and her recovery from the kidney stone. She is not recovering as quickly as what uh, the doctors would like. And so, God, we just pray for her. We pray against the pain that this is causing her. Uh, even though the, the stone was removed, we pray that the stent uh, and, and the recovery and everything can go forth and that she can be back to her full and useful self as, as, as she's a hard one to keep down. And God, we pray for Randy Bach, who on Tuesday will be having her hip surgery. Lord, we pray the surgery will go well and smoothly with no obstacles, that recovery will be quick, and that uh, the pain that she has been dealing with in her hip will be gone, and that she will be able to continue to do all that she does in her active life. And so, God, we just lift these people up to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And we ask this in his name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.